Hello, I'm Dahi O'Kiran, and you're listening to Poetic Synergy, a program that explores Eastern influences on the work of some Irish poets. Later on, I'll be meeting with a group of panellists who will explore those Eastern influences on this particular poet's work. Today, I'm in the company of poet John W. Sexton. John, you're more than welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. The title of our programme is Poetic Synergy. Could you tell us how you became interested in Eastern philosophy, Eastern poetry, and how it began to influence your work? It's kind of a roundabout way of saying it, but my mother actually dreams of the future and she can see the future. She has that kind of second sight and she can also see things and uh, she sees the dead and all kinds of things. I have a little touch. I got that by a ducus. I do see things, and I'm I'm very interested in the invisible. Um, and being interested in the invisible, when I got to my late teens, I started to look outside of um, kind of structures of thought that I was used to, which it, it, at that time would have been kept Roman Catholic. I was read a Roman Catholic. Um, I wasn't particularly interested in any kind of philosophy that had um, a political uh, structure around it or had any kind of organisation around it. I was I was looking for um, a system of thought that was freer, something that I couldn't grasp straight away and that I'd have to work at. Um, and that's how I really came by the by to uh, e- Eastern thought. First things that I started to read were actually Japanese haiku. I read a lot of uh, classical Chinese poetry, and then I started getting um, interested in uh, Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching. Interestingly with the Tao Te Ching, the Tao Te Ching is kind of statecraft. It's, It's about ruling the self but also ruling it's about government it's about ruling people um but i found that very interesting because it welded poetry thought philosophy and the invisible and i began to find things in it that resonated with me personally and resonated i suppose a little bit with that ducus that i have I like the way that you said you came to it by the by. And by the by, you had this progression to the seen and the unseen and the invisible. Could you just tell us about the process of that? Because you ended up in a welded place. But how did you come to it by the by to the invisible and the unseen? Okay, my mammy would always have dreams of things and she'd tell us stuff that was going to happen and and it would happen. Um, And uh, she had this kind of personal connection with the dead, which everybody thought was cracked, except I didn't because I have it as well. Except when I was younger, I thought everybody had it. I thought everybody heard voices in their heads. I thought everybody saw things that weren't there. But then I discovered uh, when I was younger as a child that not everybody saw this. And I began then to become very secretive. I began not to say. I learnt very early on as as a young fella not to uh, not to talk about these things. When I got into my teens, I realised that I was living in kind of two worlds. I was living in this world that everybody else lives in, but I also had a kind of connection to something else. A bit of an anecdote. My my eldest son is 23 now, but he has the mind of a, of a four and a half year old and he's severely autistic. But when he was very young, I remember sitting down with him one day. He was cross-legged in the front room. And he was lining up his little toy cars, which is a ritualistic kind of behavior that autistic people do. And I was sitting there reading the paper and the door of the living room was slightly ajar. And I saw, I can only describe them as, I saw three beings coming into the room. Now, I'm used to seeing this kind of thing. I don't see it so much now in my later years. They were made of light. They were made of energy. And they stepped into the room and I looked up at them and my son, who has absolutely no eye contact whatsoever, he had his back to the living room door and he suddenly sat bolt upright and he turned around and I could see, I could sense that they weren't interested in me. They were interested in him. And suddenly he had a look in his eyes. He was totally focused. And I could see in that moment that he could see them far more clearly than I could ever perceive them. And then they were gone. Now, the thing is, it sounds marvellous to be able to see something that isn't there. 
But when I got to my teens, realizing that I wa had a connection to something else, I needed to find something, some way of connecting to that. And I found that Eastern philosophy, certainly the Tao Te Ching, seemed to allude to a way of connecting with that. And it's interesting you're talking about the alignment of three things, because when I was reflecting on your poems for today's program, you talked about syzygy, and you can see things and you can coexist with things. In some sense, was there a freeing in you to realize that not only do you have this gift within you, say, or this course, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way, but it's like somebody else in the world sees and hears maybe in a way that I do. Yeah, yeah there, there is another thing as well. I think in my poetry... I try to, and, and this, I, 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 I think I learned this from Japanese haiku and classical Chinese poetry. Um, what I try to do, I try to marry the strange with the mundane, the world that we live in. The thing is about any aspect of spirituality, it's of totally no use whatsoever if it isn't grounded in the world that we're living in. Um, if we're just living inside our own heads, we're only trapped inside our heads. So in my poetry, um, I try to do both things. I try to take the invisible that I'm aware of, and I have to say the invisible that I think I'm aware of, because this is totally subjective. I can't prove that I see what I see. I couldn't even prove it to myself. I, I'm actually more interested in your grounded experience, okay, because it, it's not about so much about proof. And it's like, in some sense, do you notice a connection, a synergistic connection between Irish way of seeing the world in its groundedness and the Eastern view? In, in some sense, what's gone off in my head is when Oshin fell off the horse and Christianity had come to Ireland and he's give out that everybody went indoors instead of being outside. Is there any influences like that upon your work? Yeah, it's interesting that you should mention uh, Oshin because I, I have a poem about Oshin. I remember my father telling me the whole thing of Oshin travelling to Tiernanog uh, on this wonderful horse and then coming back and that when he came back he saw how feeble people were and that they were struggling moving a stone. So he just leant off his horse and with one hand tried to help them move the stone. Of course, the stirrup went and he fell off his horse and then he touched this earth that we live in. And as soon as he came back into our world, he became mundane. He became old. He withered. Now, I'm interested in that aging. I'm interested in that withering. I'm interested in celebrating that kind of withering. And uh, in my poetry and in my writing and in my thinking, I try to, to bring the whole lot together. There are three great haiku poets. There's Bashu, Basho, Busson and Issa. And the thing about Issa, Issa is an alcoholic. He was, he was a drunkard. Um, he had a fairly miserable life. He lost everyone belonging to him. He lost his children. He lost his wife. And in the end, uh, he was in his own. He was miserable. He had nothing for company except the, the insects that shared his hut. And he often wrote... Uh, beautiful poems about these insects as if they were his children. Um, and when I started to read Japanese haiku, when I started to read Issa, I suddenly realized that here we have that kind of withering, that kind of grief that we have in life. And it's grounded in the real. It's grounded in the real world because in Japanese poetry and in Japanese haiku, it was all about perceiving what you see. And just writing about that. But Issa managed to do it with emotion, with grief, with longing, with poignancy. There's, there's an early haiku of his that I really, really love. Um, and it's, he, he, was, he was awake one night and he couldn't sleep and he was in his hut. And there was only one other set of creatures with him. And they were awake as well. And he knew they were awake because they were affecting him. And he wrote this haiku. Even for the fleas, the night is so very long, so very lonely. 
And it, it was that kind of connection with what was around him, what was small, the thing that nobody else would see, the flea, the flea that was roosting in him. Um, that total connection, but also that emotional thing that here he was, he was sleepless. Uh, he, the night was long for him. The night was lonely. But also he was able to project that into these fleas that were restless on him, that were biting him, that were troubling him. He didn't look at it that way. He looked at it, ah, even for them, this is a long night. And it, it was that kind of thing with haiku and Eastern writing that I thought, ah, there's a kind of um, uh, a connection here between something that is invisible, something that's emotional, but also something that's very solid, the real world. After reading classical Chinese poetry, I started to discover the Tao Te Ching. And I found that very strange. But I also found it was a little bit like reading the Bible or, or spreading a tarot pack in front of you. I found that it could actually mean its meaning was fluid. It could mean anything. It could actually mean anything if you could find a meaning in it. And, um, you know, at the beginning, I, I felt it really spoke to me. And I felt that it spoke to a kind of not only an experience that was real, but it spoke that to that kind of invisible experience I have. One of the voices that I heard, um, and I know this sounds totally cracked, but one of the voices that I heard as a young fella was a woman's voice in my head. And sometimes she'd tell me off, and sometimes she'd she'd uh, um, uh, she'd uh, she'd encourage me. And of course, being a young fellow, I was read in London, and I thought that this woman was was me mammy's mammy. I thought that this was Granny Curtin talking to me. As I began to get older and realised that other people weren't hearing voices, I began to think this isn't my granny. This is this is somebody else. It, but it was a woman. Sometimes she'd tell me off, but it was a kind of a motherly. Um, kind of presence inside me. I remember when I picked up the Tao Te Ching, it's one of the very kind of early verses in it. It's it's verse four in the first book. And there was just this, this verse and it said, the spirit of the valley never dies. This is called the mysterious female. The gateway of the mysterious female is called the root of heaven and earth. Dimly visible, it seems as if it were there. Yet, use will never drain it. And I thought, this invisible woman, that kind of spoke to this mysterious female that was in my mind. And the Tao Te Ching that talks about governing people and governing your personal life and then following this um, kind of invisible way, this path. And the interesting thing about the path into Tao Te Ching is that the author, uh, in some stages, doesn't really know what it is and tells you very clearly what the path is and then might turn around and tell you that they don't really know what the path is. And I like that. I thought, I like this book written by someone who is actually discovering what they're writing about themselves and reformulating it at every step. We've explored a lot of emotional fluid energy there from a female perspective. So I'm going to go off in a slightly different direction with the question now. You spoke about this voice in, in your head that you imagined to be your grandmother's voice. And in one of your poems, I can't remember which one now, you talk about coming home to Brosna and Kerry to your grand, uh, to your mother's place, and it must have been your grandmother's place, and meeting all these uncles. Yeah. And for me, because we're looking at Eastern influence, and you have this invisible route that you're not really sure that you're fluid, fluidly experiencing and you're not even aware maybe yet that you're experiencing it and you suddenly become possessed by these group of uncles I wonder did that invisible gateway open for you there as well that brought you to the east I'm um, just explore that question with you John if you go to the east it's all men and if you look at eastern philosophy and if you look at eastern poetry and if you look at haiku and if you look at classical Chinese poetry the authors largely are men um, women in that period are kind of invisible. When they appear, 
they're very striking. Uh, in Japanese haiku, um, the female uh, presence is Chioni. Uh, she was a nun. Um, in ch classical Chinese poetry, the women that appear are usually women who have been treated very badly by men and um, they've been abandoned and their poetry uh, is really a lament of terrible stuff that happened to them. Um, when I kind of came home in the holidays as a young fellow and saw all these uncles they were fantastic they were characters they were blackguards they were they were totally mental but through that very male kind of society there was a very powerful a female presence and that was the the presence of grannies um, and mothers. I'm not sure if that had any kind of bearing of g when I went into uh, reading Eastern philosophy. I don't. Th I'm not sure that it did have any relevance. Except, I think I began to notice one of the first things I noticed when I started reading Eastern poetry was the an absence of women. And because it was largely men, I started looking for the women. I wanted to root them out. I wanted to hear what they what they said what they had to say. That's why I think in the Tao Te Ching, when there's this reference to um, the, the mysterious female, and it's not actually a sexual thing, you know, it, it talks about the gateway. But then when it says the gateway, it says the root of the gateway. At the gateway, the gateway is the root to heaven and earth. It's, it's not a sexual thing. It's something else. Um, and what that something else is, we have to discover. I'm 53 years of age. I haven't discovered it yet. I don't think the author of the Tao Te Ching really discovered it. And now I'm going to look at the tactile aspect because I'm struck in your poems, you know, the touch and the spikiness of the Fiocodon or the Tissel, the dewiness of the morning. So I just wonder for you, John, how is that femininity, that gateway to femininity expressed in a tactile and a feeling way? Well, you know, men don't really touch they're not touchy feely women are the whole idea of the feminine in everything i perceive i think comes from not simply this feminine side that men encourage in themselves if they're wise i think it comes from what i did, would describe as this feminine self poets when they write about the tactile when they write about nature when they write about the emotional. I think they are tapping into that feminine energy that informs the universe, that feminine energy that is creative. I believe I have this female side. I feel that that is the thing that brings that kind of tactile energy or element into my writing, but I don't know. Now, to explore the synergy and to celebrate John's work, I'm joined by Eileen Sheehan, a Kerry poet. I'm joined by Jesse Lendeni from Salmon Poetry at the Cliffs of Moher and by poet and member of Aestana, Mary O'Malley. We've listened to John W. and we've seen that he explored Eastern philosophy and poetry and he tried to weld them together into his own experience as a person. And from that exploration, I wonder, Eileen, what do you think he brings to his own work as an Irish poet? I suppose for me, reading his work, I mean, at heart, he's a nature poet, I think. Or, or that's one of his facets and his attitude to nature in his work ties in very much with that eastern attitude towards nature you know that there's no sharp distinction between um, humans and the rest of the world there's like an equality between all living beings and, and that all beings have value and also that sense of the divine which he brings into his work and, and it's, it's not almost like a godhead it's like the divine is imminent it's everywhere and and that comes through all his work and isn't it interesting that he he describes his poems as pagan poems mm -hmm. yet they're so deeply spiritual through the way they mm -hmm. the bring us to spirituality through nature yes actually that struck me very strongly um in reading uh, a poem called the drift he uses the image of the fish a lot the, you know, the Christ fish. I won't quote the whole thing, but it's the red fish leaping from the mouth to the empty source spilling down through stars and through the watching courses of stone and to the fixed mesh abstracts unerringly each hour with all its 
clamoring brood jerking routinely to the tune. So it's, again, it's very much, I think, something of John's from the kind of sublime to the ordinary or from doing the reverse transcendence so that something is coming to us and we may recognize it or not. That seems to play over and over. I think that's very beautiful to try to um, express it. You have to, you know, and it's his way, as he was saying in the interview, you know, you find a way to express the inexpressible, <laughs> mm-hmm. conveying the unseen. And you can do it. I think he does it well. And in some sense, he attunes us to more than what he sees by mm-hmm. going to nothingness. Mm-hmm. So, Mary, I just wonder, how does he express the invisible or how does he make it real for the reader and the listener of his poetry? What I was thinking in relation to John's poetry or to any poetry that I consider to be true poetry, it deals not just in the anecdotal immediate surface of things, but in the liminal and the oblique. In a way, it's, it's an antidote to what passes for public discourse these days, which is much of which is either a language that is almost devalued to the point of gibberish or is entirely lies. He spoke in the interview, interestingly, of the invisible and seeing the invisible. And of course, it's in whether you, I perhaps would see it more as the subconscious, but indeed it it is invisible, it's the other side of things. We need another language, and often it's the language of image and poetry that we need to deal with that deeper truth. And I think he does this very, very well. In his case, he does it by access to what he, I now know, has a belief in Eastern philosophy. It's very clear that he's Mm -hmm. well read in classical Chinese and Japanese poetry. But if you go to Vortex, he's very much in this world as well. Mm -hmm. And very much a poet of the immediate, the urban and the almost unsayably cruel in this life. Mm -hmm. For example, in um, his poem on notes towards a tale of wonder a child falls from a tree and is impaled through the heart by the spiked railing surrounding a churchyard. Now where do you go from there? And where he goes from there is into a poem. There's the grieving for the child. The child then goes to a transcendence into light, into water. Again, water comes up a lot as well. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, the baptism into water if you like. You can see um, a huge amount of that Christian imagery but I love it. I actually like when things move off mm. against each other. I think that in, uh, it makes the poems much more powerful. Mm. Yeah. And in that particular poem, isn't it wonderful? Oh, I mean, that's told in an almost journalistic yes. fashion. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's even in the how, title. How else it's could you tell notes it? towards mm-hmm. a tale of wonder. Mm-hmm. And, and it goes from the very uh, horrific mm-hmm. opening of mm-hmm. a child falls from a railing and that is impaled. That we all hear about all the time, this horrible things. Absolutely mm-hmm. parallel but simultaneous mm-hmm. 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 other mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. Which I feel is because it's presented in the same manner Mm -hmm. and the same mode of expression suddenly becomes totally believable. We we don't question that this child fell in the school railings. So neither do we question then when when he tells us fish as large as seals appear beside him, Mm -hmm. their bodies speckled with gold and silver. They swim at either side of him, low against the shingle, their tails sweeping the floor of the estuary. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect example of where the visionary (laughs) and the real come together. Just going to say about that, that Mm -hmm. it struck me, is that when I first read that, Mm -hmm. I said, oh my God, it's so, what a horrible image. Mm -hmm. You're feeling sorry for the child immediately, Mm -hmm. but in the end, you're feeling sorry for the people left behind. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. You know, so you go go through that, the whole, Mm -hmm. you know, turns on your Mm -hmm. head, the whole poem, and you've been turned on your head before you know it. You, exactly. I, I just wonder could we mm-hmm. explore the holistic aspect of that because you mm-hmm. said you started with grieving for the child in that mm-hmm. particular poem then you grieve for people left behind and there's a transcendence and Eileen had talked earlier about an imminence in his work. In what way mm-hmm. does he capture the reader's attention because you said earlier Eileen that he just makes it seem ordinary. How does he capture this extraordinariness mm-hmm. in his ordinariness? Wow, that's Image I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, and, very yeah. sure and a uh, controlled use of image, yeah. I would say, yeah. primarily. The poem called The Drift, which you might not always have, that's actually much more complex, much more wordy, much more um, demanding. And I think there John is kind of playing with um, the kind of mental confusion, the going round and round towards something. But then in the uh, Chinese influence poems, there's ordinary language, very down to earth, but then you've got the symbols, you've got snails come up again and mm. again. And I think that's mm. the the connection with nature. But also mm-hmm. what we think of as inconsequential, mm-hmm. which is massive. And the the snail riding uh, 
silver and the spiral on the glass yeah yeah mm. Breath, yeah just just about the snails there jesse that mm. you're talking about in that particular poem john talked in the interview about finding the key to the feminine energy of the universe no. in some sense does he bring us to the ground in his his nature imagery that is so grounded through his use of snail because the snail keeps reappearing through his it poems. does yes mm-hmm. but i think the snail is a powerful eastern image as well and mm-hmm. it configures in its shape you know yes, it's, 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 yeah, it's an image that the spiral, the spiral yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that central yeah. shape of what we like to see as the central mm-hmm. shape mm-hmm. of energy mm-hmm. or universal energy and being you can't use the snail neut- neutrally mm-hmm. if you, the poetry is slightly mm-hmm. eastern because it is already an immensely powerful symbol. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes back to Basho Mm -hmm. and Issa Mm -hmm. and so on. And I think he brings all of that as well. I you explain to the listeners about Basho, if you don't mind, Mary? The great uh, Renga and haikuist uh, of... uh, classical Eastern poetry would use that among other symbols. It would be um, the most well known. He'd be the best known. Yeah. And John has poems dedicated to both he does, uh, yeah. Basho and Issa amongst a host of other writers he, he dedicates poems to. Yeah. And that's that's wonderful reading his work generally as well, is that huge respect that, that he has for the tradition of writing that has gone before mm-hmm. and it's a tradition from lots of different cultures, not just Eastern. You can see how in his own work he's relating to the work and the mm. thoughts of others. That, but that, even if that you didn't mm. you say we didn't mm. know any of that and we don't have to know yeah. any of that, um, having said that the image carries a power with it, it's then what use you make mm. of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yes. he has this mm-hmm. beautiful thing in one of the poems about it's, uh, yes, in his mm-hmm. dream Issa pulls a turnip from the ground, unravels the world and I move on. <laughs> in the cold morning he takes snails to the graveyard for lack of flowers. Mm-hmm. Upon each gravestone a snail leaves silver prayers. It's a happy weeps. That mm-hmm. notion of the silver prayers, the writing of the snail with the silvery, while it's not a new one, it's very, very powerful and well placed within this poem. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. And, and the notion even that in a dream you can pull a turnip from the ground mm-hmm. and what happens? The world unravels. Yeah. I love that. And you you can almost see that long, thready mm-hmm. um do you remember the turnip people the turnip. who used to pull the yes. turnip and the turnip, and mm, this huge exactly. turnip, it, and the whole mm, family, it took a whole family to pull the turnip. To pull the turnip. <laughs> it's that, it's that sort kind of, of resonance. It, turnips turn up um, a lot of... Yeah. <laughs> we could talk till the cows come home, but there is nothing superficial in his work. No. There is no such thing really yeah. as, oh, I've read Issa, so I'm going to write a poem for Issa. I, exactly. It's, it's a very mm. genuine, mm-hmm. deep... Mm-hmm. connectedness filtered that he's through, making. Filtered through. He yes. understands. Yes. And he's, do, he's reading it and writing it because he understands. Because he understands and to make it. it and, and it's a yeah. very real, his dedication as well t- to the craft mm-hmm. of poetry mm-hmm. because he is a formalist. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whether he, he writes sonnets, villanelles, ballads mm-hmm. are a big part of his, his work mm-hmm. as well, <coughs> as well as haiku and, and more minimalist forms. But uh, no matter what form he's writing in or indeed what genre it's the same voice Mm -hmm. it's the Mm -hmm. same vision Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty unique at the moment Mm -hmm. in Ireland in Mm -hmm. Irish poetry Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eileen Sheen Jesse Lindenny and Mary O'Malley thank you all so much it's been a wonderful thank you this series has been kindly funded through the Sound and Vision Scheme which is a funding scheme from the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. Authority of Ireland. Authority of Ireland. Authority of 